It's a journey that you're only gonna do once and it's something you'll remember for the rest of your life, something you'll never be able to repeat. And there it is, it's a fucking indelible record of our time together. This is what we made and we're all sitting here. It still sounds pretty fucking good to me, man. That was one of the first things Tyler and I started messing around with. We had a conversation after we'd done this gig. I started talking to him about doing a record and he said, let's do it. So we started messing around with riffs and stuff. And I think that was one of the first ones I whipped out on him that he was like, that's fucking cool. We should do something with that. It's a tone setter. Hence its title is a tone. A tone. Gotta find a way to a tone, dude. Come on. That part, Jerry, it feels amazing. Oh, cool, and when we come in, ah. The first time I heard a tone, I was like, holy shit, this is Jerry, but it's Spaghetti Western Jerry. It's kind of got a Wild West vibe to it a little bit. Desert survivor type. I love that. It's one of my favorite Stephen King stories. <laughs> I had that riff around for ages. I just didn't really know what to do with it. I tried demoing a couple of iterations of the idea throughout the years, but until Tyler and I sat down and started messing around with it, it kind of came into focus. It's an open tuning that I've used on a couple of songs. It's a major tuning for like slide playing and stuff, but it's all like major chords. And he's like, leave it to you to fucking write a minor thing on a major fucking tuned instrument. <laughs> it's like, that's so fucked up. Yeah. You know, because it doesn't sound major at all. I think Duff's used to be on this side. JC! Duff's a really good friend of mine and he's just an amazing player. He intended to only play like a song or two. But once I got him in the chair, I'm like, hey, try this, check this one out. Oh, okay, all right, cool. Two, three days or something like that. He did the whole fucking record. This whole project, it was all friends and friends of friends. It was a really open play field. Let's get together and, and make some good rock. You can compliment one another musically and be on like a cool fucking bro level together too. Like, yeah. It's pretty fucking rare. All the musicians on the record have a fire about them, just an inspiration. Every, every single one. Yeah. And everyone has such a disparate background from the next, but there's this median where everyone is cultured in a way where it all makes sense organically. To step into what Jerry wanted to do with this record, there's a syntax that you need to truly understand or else it's not gonna be authentic in the eyes and ears of the audience. A song like a tone is not a dead ringer for a radio song. There's this sort of this purity about making a song like this and this whole record actually that I find to be absent from a lot of newer rock music. Rock music is underserved these days, I think, commercially. So we served you some up. Yeah. Something's clunky. Well, it's not clunky on my end because I'm a fucking badass, you know, but. Not necessarily saying it to you directly either, but if it, if, just to say if there was something clunky, it wouldn't be coming from this area. Fig's <laughs> effort on this record cannot be understood. It, it can't, it can't. It's, He's with me every step of the way, demoing and writing and stuff like that. Right there. Let's do this one. Yeah? Well, I just, I like where you were going there. I'm really glad that I've had Fig to go through those fucking long sits before it even gets to the process of the band or even recording. Because it allows me time to develop what the fuck I'm looking at.
It's like yeah. hundreds of ideas. Yeah, yeah. sometimes it's, it's riff mining, and he's got a phone full of, well, maybe <laughs> well, the phone in a, in a lock safe yeah. somewhere, and he'll just sit there, <laughs> and I'll just roll. And I'm put, dropping markers, I'm like, that's cool. That's, that's cool. cool. That's great. That, uh, that's, uh, and yeah. then it starts shaping up. <laughs> Hey man, you roll your cuff up. I think. Get off my fucking hair or my fucking sweater. Where's your hair man? band? <laughs> what happened to the scrunchie? <laughs> the whole process has started without a plan. It's just the intent to get somewhere, right? And and you just kind of figure it out as you fucking go along. You let it go where it's going. Yeah. You know. Yeah. It's almost like a an author who's writing pages as they go, and the whole story's coming yeah, together. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. This was done off the clock. So there was workshopping, and then we played some shows, and so there was camaraderie that was cultivated through that. And then as Jerry continued to develop his ideas, the album started taking shape. Some of the lyrics, like you came over with the lyrics to Brighton, and I thought, you know, that is the record right there. That's the title. <laughs> One thing about Brighton that I really love is the interplay between darkness and light. That in a nutshell is like the pursuit of my life. The major, the minor, the dark and the light. Like finding the balance, turning the table over every once in a while. Like, whoa, what the fuck was that? And then back. I love that shit. Gil killed it. He fucking played some great stuff, but when Joe came into the mix, he was like, we've got a lot of players on this, should add some more players for depth, just for different feels, and that, so that's how Abe came into the picture. For an artist like Jerry, who's been in a band, Alice in Chains, even though he's been at the vanguard of it, you know, it's different when you're stepping away from that for a second and just being yourself. One of the freedoms is that you can pull so many different musicians from so many different walks of life. So the guys who are playing on this album, I mean, you know, Duff playing bass and, and Greg on guitar and vocals and Tyler producing and all, you know, like there's such a great depth of people. Looks fucking sick. The splitting of the record between you two made it really cool. Here's the secret sauce. When I was 16 years old, I had a red 87 Escort that I bought for like 800 bucks. <laughs> and I had, it had a cassette player in it. And obviously you have like the cassette thing that turns it into a disc man, you know? You have to put the disc man on your lap <laughs> the to adapter. afford the shocks. It's like know? sliding around but all over the place. But I had two cassette tapes. I, only, I had two <laughs> cassette tapes and one was Justice For All and one was Dirt. And those were the two, only two cassette tapes that I had in the car. I had already learned so much from him over the years. I stopped writing in the harmonies and, and from Lane and just a lot of stuff, you know, over the years that you, know, you pick up as a singer who studies other singers. I uh, was pleasantly surprised when Jerry and Greg really connected and their voices worked so well together and they had a great friendship that ebbed from that. We were in Barisi's <laughs> mixing. I remember there was a point where he had like all the vocals soloed and I could, now that I listen to the record, I can hear myself now because I'm, I'm aware of what I'm hearing. Yeah. But there was a point where I was like, I can't, I could see my voice, like, the, and I can, I can look at it and be like, I'm at the same volume level as him, but I can't fucking tell. It, it like, sounds made like this, this other, other thing. thing. It was hard to start to tell us apart at times, you know. Yeah. And now, like I said, now that that's I know, the point. Now that I know that's what I'm point. hearing more and I understand yeah. what you're doing, like I'm like, oh, I can hear myself, obviously. But at the time when I was, that was so new to me because I only harmonized myself, like in all the stuff I've ever done, <laughs> you know, for the most part. And I was like, oh shit, like this is wild. Like it adds, it makes it almost like a different voice completely. Like, it does, yeah, it's like one and one equals three. It's just part of the language that I developed with Lane and it's, it's part of the language that I continued with William. And, and it's really cool to, to have that relationship with Greg on this as well. And not, not just for this record, but it'd be interesting to explore more of that in the future, you know? For sure. Yeah, pilot, co-pilot.
and either one's got to be able to be the other at the fucking flip of the fucking switch. Fig brought in Vincent Jones. He's all over this record, and it made it so cool. We tried lots of stuff. We did piano, we used harmonium, we did Mellotron stuff, Wurlitzer stuff, strings, all different kinds of stuff that you maybe wouldn't normally associate with Jerry and his music, but he was completely open. If it sounded good, he was all in. It was a real treat to do. I think acoustic guitar is a really great texture. I think for song structure, that's a really good indicator if you've got a good idea or not. When we did Sap and we did Jar of Flies, MTV Unplugged, that's where you know if you got a fucking good song because <laughs> there ain't nothing. You can't, down, yeah. you can't fucking hide it. Man, you cannot hide. So that's where it really reveals the structure of a song. Too many heads broke, too many times. Tired of the same joke, tired of the grind, coming down's a bit slow, harder to stay, same punk in the mirror, different the day. That was nice, like at the end of Mirror, you're like, ah. Put a little, uh, little stank on it. Yeah. Michael Rose on on uh, pedal steel. Yeah, Mike killed that fucking song. Michael's a formidable producer. Yes, he in his is. Own right and a great musician all the way around. He really played some great pedal steel on the record. Most of the stuff I've done is pretty extreme and noisy and, and loud and distorted and like mm -hmm. there's not been a lot that I've been a part of that had heaviness in a different way. As he was talking about this, I was thinking about how heavy an acoustic guitar can sound. Being a part of this has taught me a lot about space and layering and different textures and lighter things can be heavier. And, or, Thing can add up to be heavier. It's not just like, let me find the most crushing yeah. sound. It's like, no. I maybe. think one of the heaviest songs we ever fucking recorded is Nutshell. Yeah. And that's an acoustic song. Yeah. That's heavy as fuck. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Slammed home in a prison. Forgotten, locked away. Comes a decision. Break your heart in two. A testament to the songwriting on this record, especially speaking of acoustic guitar, there's space for the listener to actually process the music. There's always something happening in the music to sink your teeth into, whether it's vocal melodies, uh, cinematic, musical elements. Tyler is not only a composer and a conductor of music and film and scores, he's also a composer and a conductor of people. You put good people together and you create a good working environment that's really fun and easy to be creative in. Making a record is a fucking grind. Any one of these guys can tell you that. You have to have some jackassery. You gotta have some fun. You gotta have some light moments. And that's what's really fucking cool about it, you know?
That was cool. Now give me a give me a shorter one. Ba ba ba. Oh, do do do. Okay, okay. We should freak the fuck out of Tyler. And let me do an overdub. That's all. Yeah, the reverse around the world on that thing. <laughs> I have a certain sound and a style, I guess, that I've developed with the band that I've been in. You know, Siren Song again, yeah. it was like, wait. This still sounds like Jerry and what I know as a fan and what I like, but it's uncharted territory also. And I love that there's a couple of those tunes that have that Western vibe. It's a natural evolution and it's still totally him in just different ways. The two songs on the record that have that sort of a feel are the opening of side A and the opening yeah. of side B on the vinyl. Siren song and a tone. There's a real longing in that tune. The theme is kind of a longing for a love that can never be. But that's okay. It's something you can draw nourishment from, a time or a feeling or an emotion you have with somebody in your life. It's super epic. There were visuals that I kept getting by this movie that I really, really dug a lot was Willem Dafoe and, and Pattinson, The Lighthouse. Fucking sick. There's a little bit of that element of a idea of like a figure, like the mermaid figure. Does she exist? Does she not exist? Whatever, you know. She don't lie, she wants That would be cool. This record for me is one of those classic records where there is space for you to experience melody and harmony and the emotion that is evoked through the lyrics and the way the chords are structured throughout the songs. The way this record is orchestrated is really amazing in that regard. It feels good to listen to it and you just want to keep turning it up. Hard drive space. <laughs> All right, so the chorus. Mm -hmm. Now we can do the chorus. Yes. Most of the vocals were done in my my little bedroom yep. studio. <laughs> yeah. Come on. Ah, da 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 da. All right. I'm saying some.
the last three records we recorded a bunch at my house and we've got cats crawling all over the place and crying in the fucking mics and yeah. shit. Put her up on the mic. Got it. There's two cats. I'm at the mic. They're trying to jump up me and climb me or climb the mic stand. And, <laughs> and if you lock them out, they make more noise than if you keep them in the room. So yeah. we've learned how to work around them. <laughs> it's pretty funny. Their influence is yeah. it's on the record. They're, they're definitely in there somewhere on some track. <laughs> cool. You ready for your solo, Ted? It's just a small little operation, man. It's really fun working that way. Now that it's all over, the birds can nest again. I lonely snow when the sun comes out, I'll shine. I mean, listen to how much fucking emotion and a drama is in a minute and 46 second song. You know what I mean? Like that much packed into that fucking little bit of space. And that's what turned me on to music when I was a kid. And the first artist that I had that connection with was Elton John. That's when the lights went on. Like, oh my God, I listened to that and moved by that. Doesn't matter that that's me or Elton's version or whatever, it's fucking perfect songwriting and production and execution. I will write songs for you. I'll be your silver spoon. I love all of his stuff. I love all the hits and all that shit. But that song, and there's another song called Curtains, which ends Captain Fantastic and the Ground Dirt Cowboy, and they're kind of related. Very short. They're both close albums, and they're very potent. That was when Vincent came into the picture, and it was fucking cool watching him work, man. He's like this garage. 30 fucking keyboards in it, and it was the very last thing that we recorded on the record. That was nice. Black Gives Way to Blue, which Elton played on, is in a song like that as well. I think it's only about two minutes long as well. I can totally see the connection between this song Curtains and Black Gives Way to Blue. And that was a song I wrote to say goodbye to Lane and to say hello to the future with my friends and our new bandmate, William. So for Elton to be a part of that was like the universe telling you you're doing the right thing. I know him a bit. I reached out and I said, I covered one of your tunes. Can I send it to you? You know, I'd just like you to check it out and make sure you're okay with it. And it was like three o'clock in the morning and I was in bed. David got back to me. He's like, Elton is sitting at the breakfast table right now, weeping at how beautiful a job he did on his song. Like, it's amazing. And then he called me like two minutes later. <laughs> like, oh my God, you know, you did such an amazing job. You made it your own. The vocal thing you put on there is cool. Absolutely, you have my permission. Put it on the record. When you were 10 years old, you ever think Elton John was gonna call you on the phone one day and be like, <laughs> you know, you just brought me to tears as the version of the song that you're singing. I'm like, what a wild, yeah. weird thing we're all on, you know? I made the man tear up a little bit. That made me very, uh, very proud. We're all a collection of everything that pours in our ear holes and fucking comes out our fucking fingertips and shit, you know? And it's just cool to be part of that cycle. I'm really, I'm really proud of this fucking record. And I made a lot of really good friends making it, you know, and strengthened relationships I already had, you know.
You guys digging the new record? Yeah. All right. That's fun. It's the first time I've ever played these fucking songs live. It's pretty cool.